So you're having angioplasty tomorrow, or yeah, okay, yeah. an angiogram. Okay. So it's a te- okay. Well, we'll keep you in our prayers. If that's a- yeah. Yes. Good morning. morning. We want to welcome each one here this morning, especially those visiting with us on a beautiful Sunday morning. And it's good that we come together as God's people to to worship and to praise Him. Just want to uh, keep a few people in our our prayers. I'm thankful that Keith Benheisen's um, had a stent put in and that went well. Um, Also, Thankful that Sharon's able to be with us. Um, she's struggling a bit uh, with tests, and we pray that she continues to grow in strength. And I want to remember Gerald Van Zee. Um, he's going to be having angioplasty tomorrow. Let's see falls. Remove a blockage. So we hope, pray that that goes well. Our call to worship this morning comes to us from Isaiah chapter 55. It's printed for us in our bulletins. Come, all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Give ear and come to me, hear me, that your soul may live. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the evil man his thoughts. Let us begin our worship this morning by turning to number 656, Take Time to Be Holy. Getting in nothing is 
sing to see. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus. Thou shalt be thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide, and run not before. God greets us this morning in these words, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ, His only Son, through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And our God, having greeted us, let's take a moment to greet each other. Good. And let us continue our worship by turning to number 713, Seek Ye First. to 757 soon and very soon.
turn to our responsive reading of the law which is projected for us and the response comes from words of Jesus from the Gospels. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not covet. And reading those, we can all see that we've all failed in keeping God's law. And yet, he promises us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Now shall we go to our our God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come unto you in this morning and we thank you that you are our God, the creator of the heavens and the earth and our Creator as well, and you have made us in your image. And we thank you, Lord, for that privilege of being made in your image to give you honor and glory and praise. We thank you that we can come and cast all our cares on you and that you hear our prayers. Lord, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of children. We thank you for the gift of being young men and women of being aging adults, being the, having the privilege of growing old. And Lord, 
often we take our lives for granted, and yet we know that each day of them is in your hand. Lord, we, we pray for those who are going off to college. We ask, Lord, that you will bless them. We ask that you will guide them. Pray that you will guide them in their friendships and that they may always stay close to you. We pray, too, that you will be with the children as they go to school. We ask that you will bless them with clear minds, that they may be able to, to learn the things that you would have them learn. We pray, Lord, that you will be with those who are busy doing jobs, trying to make ends meet. Lord, we pray that you will grant them what they stand in need of, give them strength, give them endurance, sometimes when days get long. We ask, Lord, that you will be with those who are aged. For those who are not able to come and worship with us, Lord, we ask that you will bless them, that they may know that you are with them. We ask, Lord, that you will be with those who are, are struggling with health problems. Lord, we pray that you will be with Sharon. We ask that you continue to bless her, give her strength. We pray that you will bless the doctors so that they may be able to, to help her. We pray, too, that you will be with Gerald. And we ask that you will bless him tomorrow and bless the doctor who attends to him. And that it may go well and that he may continue to enjoy life. Lord, we often take those things for granted when it goes well. We just assume it will, and yet, Lord, we know it's by your guiding hand that it does. We thank you that you were with Keith Venheisen this past week and that you were with the doctor who, who put a stent in for him. And we ask, Lord, that you will, will bless him, that you will give him strength. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we have the privilege of coming together as your people to worship and to praise you. We thank you for this place. Lord, we ask that you will continue to bless those who come to worship. That you will use your church here in armor to touch the lives of many. And that young men and women, boys and girls, may come to know you and trust you as Savior and Lord and find meaning in living in knowing you. Lord, we thank you as we look around and we see a lush community where everything seems very green and the crops seem abundant. We ask, Lord, that you will continue to bless that they may make it to maturity. We pray that you will bless those who bring them in, that you will give them safety. We pray that they may be used for your purposes, that they may be used to feed the people of this world, and that there also may be a profit for those who, who grow them, and that it may all be used for your honor and glory. We thank you, Lord, for this land in which we live, this country where we enjoy much freedom. We thank you for those who protect our freedoms. We ask that you will watch over and protect them. We pray that you will be with those who, who lead our state and country. We ask that you will give them wisdom, discernment. Lord, we look at the news and we're often discouraged by all the problems, by all the conflict. We ask that your will may be done here on earth as it is in heaven. That we may always look to you that we may seek to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we may love our neighbors as ourselves. We read your law, and we're convicted that we fall far short of that. And yet we thank you, Lord, that with you there is forgiveness. Help us always to live life in appreciation of your forgiveness shown to us in Jesus Christ that you so loved the world that you sent your one and only Son, and that he would die for the sins of the world, for our sins, so that we may be right in your eyes, that we may enjoy eternity in heaven when our days here on earth are done. Help that to be our focus, Lord. Help us to always look to you and for what you've done for us as we seek to live our lives one day at a time, out of gratitude to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
And at this time, we ask the children to come forward for a children's message. It's good to see you guys this morning. You're all looking very good. You're all feeling good? Enjoying being back in school? No, yeah, kinda, not really. How would you like to, you're, I, you're all looking really good. How would you like to just stay the way you are and never change? That'd be okay with you? It would be? Your moms and dads, they'd probably like that too for a little while. Um, but after you lived in their house for 30 years, they might say, boy, those kids really should grow up. And you probably have things that you would like to do and be in life. Um, any of you have anything that you would like to be? A counselor. Anything else? Anything any of others of you would like to be? Can't think of anything? A power lineman, yeah. There's lots of opportunity in our country to do lots of different things. We can work in the medical field. We can work as teachers. Um, we can work as farmers, as businessmen, lawyers. Um, some, a few get to be professional athletes or entertainers. There's all kinds of different things, opportunities that we can be. And yet, if you're going to be those things, you probably need to go to school, don't you? You've got to learn a little bit more. You're going to have to grow. You're going to have to get bigger physically. If you want to be a power lineman, they're probably going to want you a little bit taller, um, a little bit stronger. If you want to do some of the jobs, you sometimes need to learn a little more. And so you need to change. And as people made in God's image to serve him, we always need to change. We need to grow, too. We need to grow in our faith. It says if you try to stay the same, you usually don't do that. Usually you go backwards. But if you try to grow um, and look to God to grow in your faith, you can, you can do that by looking to him. He can work in us. And I brought something along this morning. Something I don't think I've ever brought for a children's message before. Any of you tell me what that is? It's popcorn, yep. Now, how would you like it if I opened it up and I gave you each a handful? You'd eat them? <laughs> you think they would crunch a bit in your teeth? They wouldn't eat real well, would they? No, in order to get the benefit of popcorn, you got to have it popped. And so you got to put it in a popper or you got to put it in a skillet with oil in it and then heat it up and then it pops. And it changes. And sometimes God has us go through trials where life can seem kind of hard and yet through those problems, he changes us and he helps us to trust in him more. And so I've, I spent a bit of time popping popcorn last night. Yeah. You are welcome. Yes, and worshiping God and serving him is a joy. You know, um, oftentimes we don't look at it quite that way like we should. You go to the movies and you have popcorn, you think this is fun. Church can be fun, too. Uh, worshiping God, learning more about him can be fun. We can enjoy it. And sharing God's, God's word and his love with others can be a blessing, too, that we can do that. And so I encourage you to enjoy all of life, the little things, remembering that everything is a gift from God. So thanks for coming up this morning.
For our scripture reading this morning, we turn first of all to the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 2, and we'll read the first 17 verses of 2 Kings chapter 2. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do before I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Look, they said, we, your servants, have fifty able men. Let them go and look for your master. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has picked him up and set him down on some mountain or, some, or in some valley. No, Elisha replied, do not send them. But they persisted until he was too ashamed to refuse. So he said, send them. And they sent 50 men who searched for three days, but did not find him. When they returned to Elisha, who was staying in Jericho, he said to them, didn't I tell you not to go? And then we turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and we'll read the first seven verses from Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Words of Solomon. 
Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the street are closed, and the sign, sound of grinding fades, when men rise up at the sound of birds, that all their songs grow faint, when men are afraid of heights, and of dangers in the streets when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and desire no longer is stirred, then man goes to his eternal home and mourners go about the streets. And we turn also to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 18, and we'll read the first Nine verses. Matthew 18, beginning at verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into the fire of hell. This is the word of the Lord, and may God add his blessing to it. For those of you who didn't come up for the children's message, um, who are a little bit older, or even for the older ones who came up, I'd like you to think about when you were six years old. When you were six years old, what was most important to you? See some smiles. Life was simple when you're six years old, isn't it? Our families are really important to us. Our brothers, sisters, moms, and dads. Playing with them and having fun. That's Im important to us. Going to church with them, to Sunday school, starting school. It's exciting having meals together is fun. We look forward to that. Things like birthdays and holidays are exciting. We think little about money, about bills, about all the different things we got to get done. Life is simpler when you're six years old. I remember when I 
turned six years old, my sixth birthday. I was the youngest of eight kids. I remember that morning, it rained really hard. And mom and dad, they went away. And I was left with my older brothers and sisters. And then they came home, they had gone to armor. And they came home and it was my birthday and I had actually forgot it was my birthday and they came home with a brand new red bike that they got here in Armour. And that day, my brother and sister who were twins, five and a half years older than me, spent the day going behind me, holding on to the seat and they told me, just pedal, keep your balance, go. All day long they did that. By the end of the day, I was able to ride the bike by myself. My brother then challenged me. He went about 100 yards from home and he said, I'll run, you ride your bike. It wasn't a good thing. Um, I thought I could beat him. I lost control on the gravel and biffed it and skinned my knee, but he had sympathy on me. And he said, let's go for a ride. And again, he put me on his handlebars where I was used to riding bike. And we rode to the neighbors, Alvin and Vivian, and their kids. Life was good. When I was six years old, those simple things. And sometimes we forget what's really most important in life. As we look at the story of Elijah and Elisha, we're struck as what is important. Last week we read about how Elijah put his coat on Elisha. And Elisha was called to be his servant. And Elisha Goes, goes home, and he has 12 yoke of oxen. He was a big farmer. And he slaughtered his oxen, and he burned his, he cooked, he cooked his, the oxen by burning his plowing equipment. He gave up everything that he was doing, and he said goodbye to his family and friends to follow Elijah, to be the Lord's, servant in doing that. He was willing to give up everything, realizing what God had called him to do. And he follows Elijah for some time. Elijah is his mentor. And it had to be exciting. It had to be exciting seeing how God worked through Elijah. And yet the story we read this morning is one that's kind of a struggle for both of them. Elijah's days on earth were over. This was the last day, and God was going to call him home. And for Elisha, he would now have to go on as God's servant without Elijah there. And Elijah says to him, stay here. The Lord has called me to go to Bethel. And Elisha says, no. No, you're not going by yourself. As the Lord lives, I'm coming with. And so he goes with him to Bethel. And the prophets say there, they say to him, don't you know that the Lord is taking Elijah from you today? And he says, don't talk about it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear about that. He was intent on the moment, making the most of what he had left. And then Elijah says to him, the Lord has called me to Jericho, just stay here. And he says, no. Again, he follows Elijah to Jericho. And again, the prophets say to him, don't you know? Don't you know that Elijah is going to be taken from? He said, I don't want to hear it. Don't talk about that. And then Elijah says, the Lord has called me to go to the Jordan River. Just stay here. And he says, no. I've come with you this far. I'm not leaving you now. 
And he goes with him to the Jordan River. And Elijah takes off his cloak, rolls it up, and strikes the Jordan River. And it parts. And they walk on dry ground. And there's 50 prophets watching them do that. And as they're walking along, suddenly a whirlwind comes and a chariot of fire with horses comes. And Elijah is taken up to heaven. And Elisha sees it. And it meant something to him. It meant a lot to him. Because before that, Elijah had said, is there anything I can do for you? And he says, give me a double portion of your spirit. The spirit of God that rests upon you, let it be double for me. And Elijah said, that's, that's pretty tough. But if God lets you see me leave, it will be given to you. And if we go through the life of Elijah, we see that God worked mighty, many mighty miracles for a longer period of time in his life. He knew he needed God to be with him, especially if Elijah was going to be gone. And so he sees the chariot and the horses take up Elijah, and he almost celebrates, my father, my father. The horses and chariots of Israel. The God of Israel. That God was going to be with him. And as Elijah goes up to heaven, his coat falls to the ground. And Elisha tears up all his clothes and he puts on that coat. And he walks back to the Jordan River. And he says, where now is the God of Elijah? And he rolls up the coat and strikes it. And the prophets see it and they say, the spirit that is on Elijah is now on Elisha. And yet when he comes over there, they said, um, we have 50 men who will go look for Elijah. He said, don't do it. No use going to look for him. I mean, I saw him go up into heaven. But they insist. And so they send 50 men for three days to look for him. They come back and he said, didn't I tell you? Why didn't you listen? And we too often hear what God is trying to tell us to do, and we don't really listen. We got it in our minds. We want things to be a certain way. They wanted Elijah to still be there, even though they knew his life on earth was over and he had gone to heaven. It's important it's important that we make the most of the time. Most of the time that we've been given with those who God uses to speak to us. When your kids savor those times of Sunday school, catechism, savor those times with your family, as it goes fast, before you know it, you're not a kid anymore. And more responsibilities come. When you're young parents and you have children, savor those times. Because before you know it, your kids move out of the house and you're a little bit older. If you have grandchildren, savor those times, even when they can almost wear you out. Because before you know it, they don't come and sit on your lap anymore. Make the most of the time God gives to you. And that's what Solomon is talking about in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Solomon writes Ecclesiastes near the end of his life. He's had a busy life. And he says in the closing chapter, remember. Remember your creator. Remember your God in the days of your youth. Make the most of that time. Put that in your mind. 
Put that in your heart. May that be what drives you in life. Don't say, when I'm old. When I'm older, then I'll do this or that for the Lord. Do it while you're young. He says, he uses many symbolisms in this passage. When you can see, before your eyes fade, before they become dim, before it seems like it rains and it right away becomes cloudy. You look outside now and it's kind of hazy. When you get older, sometimes it gets that way. Um, you need a little bit bigger print to read. You struggle with that. Before you're scared to go on the heights. When you're old, you know, when you're young, it seems like you can do anything. I remember climbing up on top of my roof and shingling and hanging over. My wife hollering, be careful up there. I wouldn't go up that point at this point. It, it wouldn't be good. Okay, there's younger ones. You can do that. Before the grinders, it says, are few. And start to fall. And we can't chew as good as we used to. When your hearing gets poor. When the birds sing, but they, they seem so far away. They're faint. Says before the before the fig tree blossoms or the olive tree blossoms, they have the, the the almond tree. Actually, is what it says. The almond tree blossoms, and you look at an almond tree when it blossoms, and it's all white. But before your, before your hair turns gray, remember, remember the Lord. Before the silver cord is broken or your spine gets weak and your legs won't work, you can't walk, or the golden bowl is broken before your mind gets confused and you can't remember anymore. Remember, Solomon said. Remember your Creator. Remember what's most important. It isn't your money. It isn't your popularity, your fame. It isn't your business, your farm, your work. It's your God. It's your God. And He's a God to you, to your family, to your children, to your children's children. Remember to pass it on. Remember what's most important. And take joy in that. Take joy in serving the Lord. Make the most of the time. John MacArthur says, Rejoicing in knowing that you belong to God and that he is conforming you to the image of his son. See every event of this day as part of that process. Yield to the Spirit's prompting and take heart that God will accomplish his will. See every moment of every day, even the hard times, as God's speaking to you. This past week I I went and sold something on an auction. It was machinery I didn't need anymore. I thought it still worked okay, but brought it there. And it sold for far less than what I thought it was worth. About a third of what I thought it was worth. And I was kind of disgusted. Then I thought, I really didn't need it anymore. It was just sitting there. And I had an opportunity to use it for a while. And so why am I feeling bad about that? I didn't need to feel bad about it at all, really. And then my daughter, she saw that I was feeling a bit bummed. And she said, 
there's a movie showing tonight in armor. Why don't we go see it? She knew that I liked Winnie the Pooh. I'd watched Winnie the Pooh with grandkids. Christopher Robin saying goodbye was showing here in armor. So I went to see it with her. It's a good movie to see. It's not really a kid's It's more of an adult movie. It's a movie based on the life of the real Christopher Robin who was the son of the author of Winnie the Pooh. And his dad, who was the author, was very busy. But he took a little bit of time when Christopher Robin was young. About six years old, he went out and bought a house out in the country. And he had stuffed animals and they had names like Pooh and Tigger and Eeyore and Piglet and Rue, actually stuffed animals. You could go see them today in New York City. They're on display. But Christopher Robin grew. He was in World War II. He came back, and he too became busy in life, busy in business. And he had a daughter. In real life, he had a daughter who was handicapped. And he didn't really have time to spend with her. And he sent his wife with his daughter to that old country house. And then in his busyness, his busyness, he recalls his childhood and what meant the most. What means the most when we're children often means the most when we're old. Jesus says, who wants to be the greatest among you? He must become like a child. Have that mindset of what's important. Have that mindset of being willing to give, to be changed, to become different. It's easy to become so entrenched in our ways that this is the way it has to be. And we forget to grow. We forget to continue to trust the Lord with all our heart. When we get old, we see things slipping away. And it seems like we can feel like we're losing it all. We need to remember that we came into this world and we leave this world with nothing. No physical possessions, except we have our God who gives us life and a God who gives us eternal life. And we need to focus on him. Anything that distracts from that, get rid of it. Jesus put it quite bluntly. He said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. What causes us to sin? What distracts us? Perhaps it's our work. Maybe we should change our line of work. Maybe we should change the way we spend our time. Maybe it's our television set. Maybe we should shut it off. Maybe it's our cell phone and we should get rid of that thing. Sometimes that would be kind of handy, wouldn't it? We need to remember that those are tools to be used not things to consume us with and to take our priority. They should be used to put our focus on God. Because as we get older, we will eventually let everything go. Yesterday I had opportunity to visit an elderly couple. And their memory is fading. They no longer have a concept of time. They've been in assisted living about six months, and I asked them, they thought they just came there. I said, how long have you been here? He said, oh, about three weeks. She said, no, no, not that long, about two. It's been about six months. I said, I, 
They said, how long do you think we've been here? I said, oh, they couldn't believe that, really. But I, I said, let's go for a ride, shall we? And I had taken my little convertible that I took. I said, would you like to go for a ride? And they got in the convertible with me, and they thought, boy, this never been in a convertible before. We rode out in the country. We rode around Corsica Lake. And they were enjoying life. I said, what was the first car your husband took you on a date in? She said it was a 1952 Chevy Impala. All the other things, many things had vanished from her memory. But she still remembered that. Remember your Creator. Remember your God in your youth. Trust in Him. When you get old, it'll stick with you. I remember my mother going to that same assisted living in 2003. She didn't want to go. She was an independent lady. She liked to cook for herself and have her family come, but her health was fading. But she took with her her computer, which she had learned to use in her old age. And it was on a Sunday morning, and I had to go and preach, and she sent me this email, and I've shared it with you quite a few years ago, but I'll share it with you again. It says, at first I saw God as my observer, my judge, keeping track of the things I did wrong so as to know whether I merited heaven or hell when I die. He was out there sort of like a president. I recognized his picture when I saw it, but I really didn't know him. But later on when I met God, it seemed as though life was rather like a bike ride, but it was a tandem bike, and I noticed that God was in the back helping me pedal. I don't know when it was suggested that we change places, but life has not been the same since. When I had control, I knew the way. It was rather boring, but predictable. It was the shortest distance between two points, but when he took the lead, he knew delightful long cuts up mountains and through rocky places at breakneck speeds. It was all I could do to hang on, even though it looked like madness. He said, pedal. I worried and was anxious and asked, where are you taking me? He laughed and didn't answer, and I started to learn to trust. I forgot my boring life and entered into the adventure, and when I'd say I'm scared, he'd lean back and touch my hand. He took me to people with gifts that I needed, gifts of healing, acceptance, and joy. They gave me gifts to take on my journey, and we were off again. And he said, give the gifts away. They're extra baggage, too much weight. So I did to the people we met, and I found that in giving I received, and still our burden was light. I did not trust him at first, in control of my life. I thought he'd wreck it but he knows bike secrets, knows how to make it bend, to take sharp turns, knows how to jump to clear high rocks, knows how to fly to shorten scary passages. And I'm learning to shut up and pedal in the strangest places. And I'm beginning to enjoy the view and the cool breeze on my face with God as my delightful, constant companion. And when I'm sure I just can't do any more, he just smiles and says, Pedal. We go through life. We're called to do what we can, trusting that God, trusting that God will do all the rest. Life here is short. Make the most of each day. Remember to put what's most important first. The urgent things. The things that the world says you need to do it now often really don't need to be done so much. 
Let's put God first in all that we do as we look to Him when He calls us home. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we come unto you and we thank you, Lord, that you are our God. Lord, if we could only see life from your perspective, you must think we're quite silly putting so much emphasis on things that really don't matter. We pray, Lord, that your spirit, your spirit may rest on us, that we may have a vision of you, that we may have a vision of who you are and your love for us people, that we may live each day as if it were our last, looking to you, looking to share your love with others. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let us stand and profess what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and while our offering is being received, we'll sing number 596, I Surrender All.
Father in heaven, we come unto you in this morning and we thank you for having blessed us so richly, for giving us far more than we need or deserve. Help us to remember that all that we have belongs to you. We thank you for an opportunity to give back a portion of what you've entrusted to our care. We ask that you will multiply it, that you will use it for the furtherance of your kingdom, that you will use your church here on earth to touch the lives of many with your love, that they may believe and worship and praise you for all eternity. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For our benediction this morning, we turn to Proverbs chapter 3. The first six, six verses where Solomon writes, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. And for our closing song, we sing number 571, the first four verses of Trust and Obey. Trust and obey, for the 
there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar The joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey.